first attempt. So let's keep our fingers crossed and um, we'll just all do the best we can. Um, thank you to Seth for helping me get this set up and thank you for Lewis taking the time. And just remember to keep your microphones muted unless you are talking because you can hear a lot of background noises. But Lewis wants you to feel free to ask questions. So Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Donna. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for setting this up for you and your staff, as well as, um, you know, Willie for getting the ball rolling on this first ever Zoom meeting. <laughs> the Burke County beekeepers have come into the 21st century. Who would have thought it? <laughs> I, know, I know. Who would have thought that? Um, I also just wanted to say, you know, I hope, you know, that everybody is just staying safe and healthy and uh, abiding by, you know, stay at home, uh, stay at home quarantines. Um, now, with that being said, I hope with everybody being home, they can also work, you know, on their, on their hives and, you uh, keep up with that. Like I said to you earlier, Donna, my gardens are looking great. They've never looked greater before because I'm not traveling. So um, and I did want to mention something else that um, if you guys are taking, if you're able to take pictures while you're out on your hive, if you have any stories, any pictures, send them to the, you know, the, the Burke beekeepers at gmail.com. And uh, Willie will, you know, take a look at him if you have any questions. He'll be able to, uh, you know, answer them for you or even post them on Facebook. So, um, and that, that's really all I had to say. And um, I guess without any further ado, Lewis, you have it. All right. Let me see if I can try to share my screen here and uh, let's see what we can do. Let's see. All right, how's that? You guys see my screen, my presentation? Yep. All right, so this is the, the uh, presentation is the importance of a robust varroa monitoring and management plan. And uh, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit first about kind of spring and summer management, uh, about what we need to be looking out for as we, as we get into the groove. But let me tell you what my goals are for this, this monitoring um, portion of it. So my goals for the presentation, number one, is share what I learned from my monitoring program in 2019. I saw some interesting stuff and I want to share that with you. I also want to demonstrate that I'm not just talking the talk when I'm talking about doing all this monitoring. I also want to show you that I'm walking the walk. I'm not just saying you guys should do this. I'm, I'm doing it myself and it's working really well for me. And my third goal is to encourage everyone uh, to get out there and start their monitoring program. Actually, we're, it's, it's a little late actually to be starting your monitoring program, uh, but go ahead and get out there and, and uh, start it and, and uh, keep it going on until the end of the season, which is probably uh, middle of October. And I'll show you why that's important um, during the presentation. So those are my goals for for the, the role part, but let's talk about um, spring and summer management uh, really quick as we're, we've, we've really kind of, we're, we are in the bee season right now, it's, it's going. And so I wanna talk about the three things that I think are most important uh, as far as management uh, between now and really September, of course, number one is monitoring control mites. And we're gonna spend, uh, time on that tonight, but basically making sure your mic loads are in control at all times. You can't let those things get out of control. That is, it's by far the, the biggest challenge to be health, and it's important to put a lot of effort into that. The second one is manage queen events. So we're right in the middle of, maybe not quite in the middle of, but uh, swarm season has started and uh, it's important to kind of keep out, uh, keep a watch on those colonies that have swarmed to make sure that they are able to make a new queen and, and to right themselves. I would say that uh, two thirds of the time, a colony that has swarmed 
will make a new queen and they'll they'll pick up and keep on going. But at one third of the time, that process will break down. Either that um, queen, that new queen goes out on her mating flight and is eaten by a predator or gets lost or for whatever reason does not make it back to the colony. And at that point, that colony is hopelessly queenless. There's nothing that they can do to make a new queen. And it's really up to the beekeeper to intervene and right that ship. And so it's really important for beekeepers to understand uh, that and to know what to look for and what the, what the kind of the timelines are. So if your colony swarms, hopefully you'll have a new mated queen laying in three to four weeks. So if, if, if you, um, you know, if you don't have that in three or four weeks, uh, you need to start kind of making some plans, you know, uh, get, uh, figure out if you need to intervene or not. But so that's, that's the, I see a, that causes a lot of problems for folks, either not noticing that they had a queen event, either a super supersedure or a queen event or a swarm. Uh, and that colony winds up hopelessly queenless and, uh, beekeepers can miss that. And if you miss that, it's going to really bite you in probably June or July. Managing those queen events, knowing when to take action when, and knowing when to sit on your hands. The third thing is uh, feed only when needed. So getting that uh, nutrition just right. Uh, and this can be a, a hard one as well, especially if you, if you don't have much experience. I think uh, it can be a tricky thing. I see a lot of new beekeepers that are scared to death that their colonies are going to starve to death and they'll really uh, overfeed their colonies and some, can sometimes feed them into swarm mode, right? So um, we, we don't want to do that. So when I think about feeding, these are the things that I think about. So these are the reasons to feed. If your uh, colony is drawing comb, like you've just installed a new package or a nuke and they've got five or 10 frames of comb uh, foundation and they need to draw, feed them. You need to get that comb drawn. It takes a lot of energy. So don't be afraid to feed if they're drawing comb for you. If they're about to starve, feed them. No problem. If you need to build stores for winter, so as we get into September, and you know, as we get into September, you want a box full of healthy bees below and a box full of honey above. So if you're into September and you don't have that going on, you can feed to, to try to make that happen. Four, stimulate the queen to lay. Uh, at any time of the season. So uh, we may uh, have a dearth uh, sometime during the summer. If it gets hot and dry, that can really slow things down. If you need to stimulate that queen's lay to, to uh, build your population up, especially as you're preparing for, for winter, uh, don't be afraid to uh, feed. If you're requeening, sometimes requeening, uh, that process can, can go easier if you have a little food on, especially if, if it's during a dearth. So those, those are the instances that I think about um, when, I, when I might want to feed. And if I don't have these things going on, I'm not going to feed, right? So make sure that you have a purpose when you go out there to feed. So that, that's kind of my quick and dirty uh, spring and summer management uh, talk. It's really you know, doing these inspections, do, do, is, do I have any reason to feed? Uh, do, do, I, do I see all stages of brood? So if yes, I've probably got a land queen, everything is okay. If I don't see any brood at all, what's going on? Do I need to intervene or not intervene? What happens if, let's say, let's break this down a little bit. If you go to your colony, you don't see any stages of brood. You don't see any eggs. You don't see any open brood, larva. You don't see any capped brood. What should you do? Anybody? Find your queen. You might, so, yeah. and you can't find your queen. So, and uh, so should you run out and buy a queen right there? Uh, you could either do that or you could, um, if you have another, um, hive you can build, pull from the other hive and make them make a queen. 
Absolutely. So if you're not sure uh, what the status of the queen is, the first thing I like to do is try to determine what the status of the queen is. And the way that we do that is pull a frame of eggs and open brood from a, another queen right colony, add it to that colony that you're not sure about, uh, mark the top bar on that frame so you can come back to it in a few days. And so we come back to it in four or five days and we pull it out and we notice that they did not pull any queen cells on that frame. What would that tell us? There's a, qu there's a queen in there? That there's a queen. She might not be laying yet, but she's coming online and we need to just kind of sit on our hands and let that play out. If we pull that frame out in a few days and we see queen cells, what does that tell us? There's no queens and they're building a queen? That's right, that they were hopelessly queenless and they need our help. So and when you see those cells, you can make a decision there. You could tear those cells down and add a mated queen from, you know, you could purchase one or whatever you want to do. Or you could just let them take a crack at those queen cells and you can monitor that situation um, out. So, but I think adding that frame of open brood is an important tool in your toolbox. It can help you understand if you need to take action or, or not. So helping you discern whether you have a queen coming online or not. So I, I think the biggest problem I see is a lot of folks see that they don't have any brood of any stages and they run out and purchase a mated queen when they have a virgin running around, she's just not mated or it's just not laying yet. And I think it's important to be patient. Um, um, so keep that in mind. Any other comments or questions before we move on to the Varroa portion? Actually, I have a comment. Sure. Lewis. Um, so I split uh, three of my hives. Well, I split all three of my hives. And I actually just checked on this past Saturday. And I saw... Um, I saw the queens. I didn't see any eggs and it's been about three weeks. So yeah. your thought I should probably wait a little bit longer because she probably just went out. Absolutely. I would give them at least a week. Hopefully you'll see some eggs in a week. Yeah. But if you don't, I would give them another week, especially if you still see her running around in there. But if you're okay. not sure what's going on, you can always add that frame of brood from a queen right colony okay. and see if they pull cells. But it really is important to be patient. So from the day that you make the split, so let's say you don't have any, uh, you didn't move any queen cells with that split. You just moved eggs so they had what they needed. It's going to be four weeks before you have a mated queen, best case scenario. So it's important to be patient. And as for me as a new beekeeper, when I started, I had to really work hard at patience. I had to put that on my to-do list for about the first three years. Because <laughs> if I made a split and I didn't have that queen in two or three weeks, ah, but it's gonna be at least four weeks in that situation. So, okay. uh, and I think doing those walkaway splits, that's a, a fantastic way to learn bees, beekeeping and patience. So good for you for doing that work. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody else? I've got a question. Sure. Um, uh, the frames that you're taking out to uh, add, to pull uh, into a hive that you're not sure if there's a queen, you, you're taking all the bees off of that and just putting the frame in there. Is that right? Uh, you can go either way. So if you want to leave the bees in the other colony, you can just kind of shake them off. But I don't have any problem moving nurse bees. So those are the bees that are going to be on that frame of eggs and open brood. There's not going to be any problem with moving those uh, with that okay. with that brood. Just make sure that mom's not on it, right? Don't move the queen. Uh, but there's no problem moving those bees if you want. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good, good question. What else? I'm bringing in a new nook. Um, I just need to feed for when they take a gallon down and then just let them go, or do I need to keep feeding them? Well, it depends on, uh, well, I like to look at my, uh, uh, are they drawing, do, do they have foundation they need to draw? You know, if they have a lot of foundation they need to draw, you may need to keep feeding them. 
Uh, okay. Do you need to stimulate that queen to lay? You know, so I kind of go back to that feed when needed and only when needed list. Uh, okay. is, are there, you know, things on that list that you need to accomplish? Um, let me see. All right, there we go. So I got my pointer back. Yeah, so you need to draw comb. And the other thing about uh, packages or nukes and drawing comb is sometimes you'll need to move that foundation that's on the outside. You need to move one of those into the middle of the brood nest to encourage them to draw it, right? Mm -hmm. And then once they get that drawn, uh, you can move another one in there. But your goal is to make sure that you have at least 20 frames of uh, drawn comb as you get to, to uh, winter and into fall. The other thing to remember is bees are um, motivated to draw comb this time of year, but as we get deeper and deeper into the season, they're less and less motivated to draw comb. So if you get to August 1st and you only have eight uh, frames drawn, you are really uh, behind the eight ball there. So get that uh, comb drawn as quickly as possible. Good questions. All right, I wanna move on to the Varroa. Uh, part unless anyone objects. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. All right, so a high mite load equals a high virus load equals dead bees. And that's pretty much what you need to know. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure if all this, uh, all the stuff that we're going through with this human virus, I'm not, I haven't figured out how to really translate that uh, to be so far, but David Tarpey did a, he had a nice uh, article the other day at the NCSU Apiculture uh, website, kind of drawing some um, parallels between the viruses and the bees and viruses in humans. And I, I think one of the points that he made was in fact, it's really important for us to, uh, to test to see who has it and who doesn't to help us make good decisions. And that's the same thing with our honeybees. We need to make sure we know, we have, we have to have good information uh, if we're gonna make good decisions. So, and that's monitoring is where we get that information. Uh, so we're not gonna talk so much about how to monitor tonight. When I talk about monitoring, I'm really talking about either uh, sugar shake or alcohol wash. So I'm not talking about looking at um, frames, you know, not, not looking at bees on frames and looking for mites, that's not going to be effective. I'm not talking about uh, sticky boards. When I say monitor, um, I, wanna, I want to know uh, what I'm talking about is sugar shake or alcohol wash and identifying uh, percent infestation or mites per 100 bees. And so if you need help uh, with that monitoring, you know, with your monitoring skills, visit keepbeesalive.org and they have a great uh, it's a great clearinghouse of information related to Varroa. So there's a lot of information about Varroa on the internet. The trick is what of it is good and keepbeesalive.org. This is the Michigan Pollinator Initiative. It's a great clearinghouse of good up-to-date Varroa information. So lean on that as you're thinking about your um, Varroa plan as you're studying rural mites. Great, um, great resource. Uh, Bailey Bee Supply, it's in Hillsboro, North Carolina. This is back in Orange County where I learned to keep bees and uh, they, have a, they have a website and they have a little educational corner. It's Randall's Archive. Randall Austin uh, writes an article each month and in his March article, he says uh, management begins with monitoring and he talks about a lot of what we're going to talk about here tonight. And so I'd encourage you to uh, visit baileybeesupply.com and look for Randall's uh, archive in his March um, article. He's got lots of great articles. Uh, I think it's kind of, you know, uh, his, his articles are journal worthy. They could appear in the American Bee Journal or, or Bee Culture. It's good stuff. Um, this is the treatment thresholds uh, from the Honeybee Health Coalition document tools for varroa management. You'll find that on the uh, keepbeesalive.org uh, website, the Honeybee Health Coalition uh, document tools for varroa management. And I guess the biggest thing I want folks to understand is 
these numbers here. So colony phase, we're gonna talk about kind of from February until October. And in this column, we have the acceptable numbers. And in this column, uh, the danger zone. So when you're too far over the line and notice that there's very, very little wiggle room between things are okay and things are out of line, right? So that's one thing I wanna make sure everybody understands. There's not any, uh, very little room for error here. So if you let things get too far out of control over here, uh, you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. So it's important to keep your mites under control all the time. So less than 1% or less than 2% pretty much all season. And that can be a challenge, but uh, this monitoring is what's gonna help. Um, help you figure out what you got. So this is my monitoring uh, plan for 2019. My 2020 plan is very similar. And I monitored all queen right colonies six times during the season. I started in late February, came back two months later, late April. Uh, this is, this is um, right before I put honey supers on last year. June 4th, that's when I took the spring supers off. So I monitored there. I put uh, empty supers back on here. The more supers came off uh, at the end of July. This is my uh, kind of end of the year or end of the honey season monitoring as I'm preparing for winter uh, and my pre-treatment monitoring. Uh, September 17th is my post-treatment monitoring. So I took some action here. I want to see if it worked. And then October 21st was my end of season monitoring. And uh, I had uh, three problem children identified at that October monitoring that I had to monitor again in November. And uh, so I have about, uh, usually have about 30 colonies in my yard. And so uh, we'll look at the st statistics for each of these monitoring periods and we'll see how many I monitored and uh, what what those numbers look like as we go. And I'll show you, I think, some interesting stuff. So these are the statistics for that February monitoring. And as we look at all these different monitoring events during the season, if you see this red bracket here, that means I took some action on these colonies. So when I present my results, there, I don't identify which colony, I just give you my number. So these numbers, uh, this is infestation rate, so mites per 100 bees here from high to low. So they're uh, ordered from high to low. And anything with a red, you know, in that red bracket that was above my threshold and it got treated. And I'll tell you what I treated with and I'll tell you how, how that went. So in the end of February, I monitored 21 colonies. And these st the st statistics that I'm looking at in the mean, that just means the average. So I add all these numbers up, these 21 numbers, add them up, divide them by 21, it's the average. So my mean is 0.83 mites per 100 bees. The median is the number that's in the middle. So I, these are lined up from high to low. I have 21 um, samples, I have 10 above and 10 below, that number right in the middle is 0.33. So I'll watch that median on all these statistics. And the mode is the number that happens most often. So zero is what happened most often. Then my minimum was zero, the maximum was 4.88. My threshold, so that part where I decided I would uh, take action, I set my threshold at 0.8% for this monitoring. So I, I, I use, uh, I use this um, as my kind of uh, baseline for my thresholds through the season. And I will move them up or down as I see fit a little bit. So not more than a half percent or so through the season, but I'll use this as my baseline. All right, let's see. So I treated these uh, six colonies with Apivar in February, 20, in, in late February. So the, the thing that I wanna point out here is that um, 
a lot of people who, who do monitor, a lot of times they don't start monitoring until um, maybe August or September. Now think about what would have happened if I had not monitored in February and caught these, especially these top four that are between three and 5% just as we're starting the season, right? These numbers are only gonna go up during the season if I had not caught those early on and dealt with them, what do you think might have happened by the time that I got to August? I think that those colonies uh, would have had very high mite loads and probably would have also negatively impacted other colonies in my apiary and likely other uh, <coughs> these other apiaries in my neighborhood that could have done a lot of damage if I had not caught that early. And so it's important. The other thing about catching these early is that I'm able to, I have a, a broader range of choices with miticide. So apivar is certainly not something that you can use uh, when you're right on top of the nectar flow if you're, if you're uh, uh, trying to make honey. In fact, apivar is about between a six and an eight week treatment and those strips have to be out of the colony two weeks before you put the honey supers on. So it's important that if you're going to use Apivar, that um, you uh, get it in and out early. So that uh, is important too. I came back about eight weeks later before I put my honey supers on. So some of this was kind of um, post-treatment monitoring. Uh, the other was just making sure things are in order before I put the honey supers on. So I want to make sure things are in good shape uh, before I move forward. This month I monitored 22 colonies. The mean is 0.16, the median is zero, the mode is zero, the minimum is zero. My threshold here is 2%. I didn't have to do anything. So notice that the numbers went down quite a bit, even though I only treated six colonies. So let's talk about that. Why would numbers, why would my numbers go down over the course of two months? What's the difference between February and April? I was gonna say something about social distancing and quarantining, but I'll keep that away. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I have so much more capped brood here in April. Like we're deep into explosive growth mode and there are a lot of um, places for those mites to hide, right? So it, it is uh, easy and it is possible for you to get a false sense of security when you have that, um, when you have all that capped brood. So my numbers were, it would, it would look like that things are better in April than they were in February. That may or may not be, it's probably not true. It's probably just that mites have more places to hide, but at, at any point, it was within my threshold. I didn't do anything. I just wanted to get those honey supers on and see uh, what I could do there. So things were, looked good there. All right, so the, those, that spring honey came off at, in early June. Uh, extracted that honey and I wanted to put those supers back on to see what I could get for the summer. And I wanted to make sure things were, was, everything was still in order. And I monitored 27 colonies. Uh, the mean has gone up to almost 1%. The median is uh, 0.67. The mode's uh, one third. And the minimum still is zero. And the max is almost five. And I set my threshold at 1.6 this time. I wanted to catch uh, this and anything above that. So I got one, I have one that's, that's gone up to 5%. I definitely want to catch that. Um, I, um, I, basically, I took the, those three colonies, I took them out of honey production, tried to handle the mites, and then once I had that under control, then um, if things were in good order, then they, I could put honey supers on. And so the, the thing that I used uh, for this treatment was Midaway quick strips or formic acid. The colonies were um, in, in good shape for that. So I guess the thing, uh, for the formic acid is that you need at least six frames of bees, but not more than 20 frames of bees. So if you have less than six bees, six frames of bees, it's going to be too hard on the bees. Or if you have more than 20 frames of bees, 
it's going to be too easy on the mites. And I, I had that 20 frame uh, frame count, used the mitoweek quick strips, and it, it did bring my mite numbers down. Now, the downside is I did lose one queen to the treatment. Um, you know, during during that treatment, which I, I think was because of the formic acid. So it's that's certainly a risk uh, with the with the formic acid products. But it does not bother me uh, one bit as long as it handles the mites. I have lots of spare parts in the yard. I've got mating nukes with uh, extra queens, and it doesn't bother me uh, at all to lose a queen in a deal like this as long as I. Uh, got those mites handled. For someone with just has two um, colonies in the yard, that can be a different story. But so I think it is important to have uh, uh, spare parts available either in your own yard or have a bee buddy um, that you can borrow a frame of uh, eggs from or, or whatever. But I, I had plenty of spare parts and it went, went fine. All right, so July, this is my kind of uh, end of the honey flow for the, for the year. I've just taken those summer uh, supers off and I am now, I am in winter prep mode. So everything that I do from now until November is about making sure that I have healthy bees that are gonna make it all the way through the winter and I don't have to worry about I'm not, I'm not going to lose any sleep at all because I know that I've done my work. So that's the work that I'm starting today on July 21st. So I'm doing this uh, monitoring. Uh, I monitored 33 colonies. The average is um, about one and two thirds percent. The median is 2%. So that number in the middle, the mode, uh, the, the numbers that happen most often, 1.67 and zero all these and the minimum is zero the max is eight percent and my threshold at the end of july is zero percent so that means everybody gets treated in my apiary in late july or early august whenever i pull that summer honey off because i know what happens to my numbers in august and september they go through the roof um, as we start to have less and less cat brood, our mite numbers on the adult bees just go through the roof. And so it's really important, I think, to catch and intervene right there. So um, you can see how things are, let's see, my median is two. So that number in the middle is 2.0. And so I think the threshold where I want to stay below all the time is about 2%. So if my, mo my median is two, that means half my apiary is out of, uh, out of spec, right? Even if I set my threshold at 3%, at least 40% of my apiary is out of whack. And uh, so it's really important to catch. I would say that if I had not taken action, taken effective action here, right here, <coughs> excuse me, I would have had a very poor uh, winter with my bees. I, let me back up and say that I overwintered 29 out of 30 colonies, so I should say that. So that's kind of what I think is uh, I give this all this monitoring and control credit for that um, good overwintering, right? So, um, so I want to do, I definitely want to, even though everybody's going to get treated here, I definitely want to know what my pre-treatment numbers are because I want to know what my post-treatment numbers are afterwards because I want to see how effective my treatment was. So it's very important to know what your numbers are before you treat as well as what they are after you treat. So pre-treatment numbers and post-treatment numbers. All right, so I'll come back. Uh, Apivar is about a six or eight week treatment. So I came back uh, almost eight weeks later and did that post-treatment monitoring. And uh, I was thrilled to death with the effectiveness of Apivar. For me, it worked like a champ. So uh, look at all these zeros. So there were no mites in these samples. I think there's probably 
24 or so uh, samples there that are squeaky clean. These have one mite in the 300B sample that has two mites. This has three mites. And I think I might have had six mites here, which is a little bit out of, out of my comfort zone, but not so bad. So I hope that, you know, I'd wish that everyone could have uh, such an effective treatment. And that doesn't always happen. And I will say that I was quite, um, I was thinking about what my backup plan was going to be if I came back here at the post-treatment monitoring and found that my treatment had not been effective. I was thinking about, well, what's my, what's my next move going to be? Uh, but fortunately, I didn't have to worry about it because that treatment was very effective. All right, so this, at this point, it's, I would say that many beekeepers would just call it quits. They'd say, hey, I handled my mites. Uh, it's the middle of September. Uh, everything is cool. Um, let's put these things to bed. We can feed them up, make sure they have plenty of food, and we're done with it. We did our part. We're good. And I guess th that's this next monitoring is the most, I think, the most interesting uh, monitoring of the season. I went back only four weeks later, four weeks, and look what I found. I've got a colony at six and a third percent. So that's 19 mites in a 300 B sample. <laughs> this colony had 17 mites in a 300 B sample. This colony had 14 mites in a 300 B sample. All three of these colonies were at 0% just four weeks before, right? So what's going on there? How did things go from great to terrible in just four weeks? What happened there? Anybody have any? What, what was the uh, proximity of the first three hives? They were, they, they, they were, they were in all, close proximity. Yeah, they were all, they were in the middle of the yard um, in the same row, about six colonies. They were in that row. Uh, drifting could be a factor. Drifting could be a factor, but all three colonies were at zero just a month ago, right? Well, no, your September it was at two. The first one was in number. Well, so let me let me go back and say that these this two percent may or may not have been in that group. That was, that was just my highest number. I don't think that two percent was there, so I don't really follow a colony from month to month necessarily. I did follow these three because they were very interesting, but I don't think it was drifting in my yard. I, I will say it's, I don't think it was drifting in my yard. What I think it was, was uh, colonies somewhere in the neighborhood falling apart and either dispersing, those bees were abandoning ship and looking for another crew to join and they brought their mics with them or my, colonies were out there finding these colonies that were falling apart and robbing them and picking up mites in that process. So I think this is uh, part of the, the mite bomb scenario, either dispersal or robbing, but picking up mites as we go. And so I think it's important to understand that uh, we have to be on the lookout uh, for this stuff. Um, all right, so these three, I think, were the most interesting, just about the most interesting thing that I saw through the, through the season. And so we're going to go back and take a little closer look at those three colonies. So this is colony one, colony two, and colony three. This is at that pre-treatment. So after I took those honey supers off, and basically they, this colony's looking pretty good. This colony is a little out of range. This colony is way out of range. I applied the Apovar treatment here, brought everybody down to zero in very good shape, and then just came back uh, a month later and everybody is out of whack. And so I guess the point that I wanna make here is that um, it's important to monitor. And I think I, have, I hear people, I'll go to a beekeeper meeting and people will say, well, I have a, super mite resistant queen. I don't need to worry about mites. And 
I don't think that's true because think about, let's say, I, I think those, those good genetics are good at maybe keeping the colony uh, clean from inside, but it can't protect the colony from dispersal or robbing or whatever, you know, coming from outside. So I, I think it's important to understand that even if you do have good genetics, uh, this, it's not, it's not perfect. Um, so I think that's important to note that you really have to monitor to, to catch these sorts of things. Um, I wasn't sure what to make of this. I thought at these high loads in October, I thought, well, maybe, maybe my, the Apovar didn't work in this uh, colony. Everybody had a fair amount of cat brood when I monitored here. And so I thought, well, maybe those, the mites were in the cat brood and they were not killed by the apivar. I mean, my apivar treatment was not effective for whatever reason. And so I did a little experiment. I went back and I treated these three colonies with apivar again, which would tell me uh, if I came back and I had a high mite load still after that treatment, that would tell me that was the apivar was not effective, that my, maybe my mites were resistant to apivar. Um, but that apivar did take care of those remaining mites, so it was not a resistance problem. I, I'm quite sure it was uh, mite pressure from outside of my apiary uh, that came in and, and did that. So I think that's important to uh, be aware of. These are the um, average numbers in the apiary for all these different treatment periods. So the red lines indicate kind of that threshold that I want to stay below. I want to be below 1% early in the season and certainly below 3% uh, from June on. And at the apiary level, I met those goals. So I did a good job of keeping things uh, below my target thresholds all through the season. If you just look at the apiary level, just colony, um, just the average uh, level. And that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because at each of those monitorings, or almost every monitor, monitoring, excuse me, I had at least one colony that was above my threshold. So here, I, had, I think I had mm, at least four colonies above my threshold. Each time I had a colony above my threshold. And so I, this is why I think it's critical that in your monitoring program, you have to monitor every colony because you, your goal is to catch these outliers. It's, it's critical that you catch these outliers. If you don't monitor every colony and you miss these outliers, these are the ones that are going to get you, right? So think about here. I had four out of 21 colonies that were fairly above threshold. If I had just kind of spot checked in the apiary, if I just maybe sampled five colonies, it's very unlikely uh, that I would have caught that colony that was at 5% in February. And there's no doubt in my mind that that would have really negatively impacted me um, later in the summer and on in you know, through the winter. So it's really important to catch those outliers. In order, in order to catch those outliers, you need to monitor everybody. So just kind of kind of review with the program. Uh, monitored all queen right colonies six times. February had six colonies that needed treating. They got Apovar in April. Everything looked good. They didn't have to take any action. June, I had three colonies uh, that needed some action. They got formic acid, they got mitoid quick strips. July 21st, every colony in the yard got apivar. September 17th, everything looked awesome, no problem. October 21st, I found those three colonies that were way out of whack and they got apivar again and that brought them back in control. And in the middle of December, I did an oxalic acid vaporization when I had little to no cat brood, which is a very important point when we're talking about oxalic acid vaporization. It's really good at killing <laughs> mites on adult bees and it, it does not kill mites in cat brood. So if you have a lot of cat brood, not gonna be effective. 
this, these are my, uh, I, I started my monitoring program in 2020 on Valentine's Day. And these are uh, my results for that first monitoring. I'll be starting my second monitoring uh, this week and uh, to make sure things are still in order. But I was very pleased with my, um, as I was coming out of winter, what my bees were looking like. These, so I monitored 26 colonies. These 25 colonies here are in my yard here at my house. I have one colony that's at a farm down the road. Uh, this one colony did not get oxalic acid vaporization in December. And I don't know if that's just a, if it's just a coincidence, that that's the only one where I found a mite. But anyway, this is the first year I've done a good solid oxalic acid vaporization uh, treatment in December. And I could not be uh, more pleased uh, with the results so far. So we'll see if that holds. So that's, I'll continue monitoring and we'll see how things go in a 2020. We'll keep following this. The things that I want to make sure everyone understands is that one third, as when we're talking about miticides and treating bees, one third of the time they work as planned. So you have a high mite load, you apply a treatment, then you have a low mite load. That's what we want to happen. But that only happens one third of the time. One third of the time, uh, they work, but the mites spike back. So you have a high mite load, you apply a treatment, you have a low mite load, and then you come back two to four weeks later and the, the mites are spiked back up. So either you didn't catch the mites in the cat brood or you had some infestation from outside, right? And I definitely saw these two things in my own apiary this year. One third of the time, the treatment just flat out fails. So you have a high mite load, you apply a treatment and then you have a still high or even a higher mite load at the end of the treatment. I did not see this in my apiary this year, but I did see it in other apiaries that I looked at um, around Western North Carolina. And I see it every year. So the point that I wanna make is, I think that beekeepers uh, really uh, can be putting too much faith in miticides. They are good tools but please understand that they are not the silver bullet. There aren't any silver bullets. Um, and and you, it's really important for you to monitor to see how they're working for you. And if you're not monitoring, um, you're, you, I think you're messing up. So this is a, an example of that. Um, it's just, we'll see where this goes. This is a, the Buncombe County beekeepers have a, little apiary that they manage. And we're gonna follow one, just one of their colonies. They have probably five colonies in their apiary. And we're just gonna look at one colony and how it went. Um, so they started their monitoring in April, no mites. Things look good. Came back five, six weeks later in May, no mites, still looking good, very good. June. Early June, we got one mite in that 300 bee sample, 0.33% infestation. Not too bad for June, still in, uh, still okay. July, still just one mite in 300 bee sample, no problem, looking good. Uh, let's see, that's August, we're up to 2%. So we're kind of there at that threshold where we need to uh, think about what we're gonna do. And uh, that's the 1st of August. We know that things are only gonna get worse from there. And so they applied an Apolife VAR treatment. This is the, one of the thymol based treatments. Uh, it's in the yellow package. It's like the green vermiculite wafer that you break up into four pieces and put on the top bars. And it has uh, thymol, camphor, menthol, and one other. Uh, um, I'll think, of, I'll think about it in a minute. <laughs> but they have, did an April IFR treatment according to the label. And they came back for that post-treatment monitoring in September. And the mites had gone from 2% pre-treatment to 9% post-treatment. So complete treatment failure, right? But it's very easy. Uh, I see a lot of beekeepers that say, 
oh, well, I treated, but my bees still died over the winter. It could not have been mites because I treated. And that is not a good bet because um, there's no guarantee that your treatment was effective. It's really, it's important for you to monitor. Can't stress that enough. So they decided, well, we're gonna try some oxalic acid vaporization. Now I said earlier that oxalic acid is not really a good pick when you have a lot of cat brood, and in September we still have a lot of cat brood. But they decided they would try oxalic acid vaporization. I call it three by seven, so that just means three treatments, seven days apart. So they treated one time a week for three weeks, trying to catch stuff as it emerges from that cat brood. It's, I would say it's not, I would not recommend this at all. Uh, I would try to wave you off of that. Well, let's see what happens for them. All right, so they went from, they had 2% in July, did an apolite life bar treatment, had 9%, and they did the oxalic, vapor, oxalic acid vaporization, and they did the post treatment monitoring, and now they're at 14%. So things are continuing to climb, right? So that oxalic with a lot of cat brood is not, uh, getting it done for them. And uh, so they decided to double down on oxalic vaporization, right? So they said, well, all right, we'll step it up. We're going to do four treatments five days apart. And uh, which now that we're into October, it's a little bit of a better bet because we're having a lot less cat brood. And they went back in November and, and monitored and they had brought things down to under 3%, but I would say they spend a lot of time uh, spinning their wheels there. But that's just a good example, I think, of uh, how, you know, don't assume that your treatment uh, got you where you wanted to go. You need to assume that that treatment did not work. And you need to be thinking about what your backup plan is going to be, you know, if when you do that post-treatment monitoring. So keep your fingers crossed that that treatment did work but make sure you have a backup plan and know what you're going to do. All right. So uh, really quick, I got a couple of resources and then we'll open up to questions. So in um, November, December, I get, I don't, I'm not working a lot. It's kind of cold. Nobody's calling and, but I still want to talk about bees. So I did a, a little podcast series in uh, December and it'll get spilled over in January. It's called the well-managed hive. And you can find it, if you just Google the well-managed hive, you'll find it. But I did a, an episode with Jim Masucci. He had an article in the uh, American Bee Journal in, in the December 2019 American Bee Journal, which was top-notch. He uh, runs a bunch of uh, very large studies. Uh, they're looking at uh, some, some different uh, miticides and, and uh, therapies for viruses. And so he has opportunities to do a lot of monitoring and this article is all about what he found with all of his monitoring it really i think it mimics uh kind of what i saw in my little uh 30 colony apiary but jim they were monitoring like 2,000 colonies you know through the through the season and seeing very similar stuff and we talk about that for about an hour and so i hope that you will, if you have american bee journal if you have a subscription definitely get that uh, December issue out and look for that article by Jim Masucci or uh, but I would definitely recommend this um, podcast as well also my friend uh, John Gott he's a New Jersey beekeeper he wrote an article uh, for I don't know if it was for the New Jersey Beekeepers Association but the article and you can find it you could read it yourself at this address tinyurl.com backslash S-C-U-G-M-T-5. And you can read the, the whole article. But he says a, a successful beekeeper is a successful mite manager. And I think that's a very important point. So you're not just managing a colony of bees, you're also managing a colony of mites. And that's an important um, thing to understand if you want to be a successful beekeeper that you've got to you have to be a successful mite manager as well. And your plan, your mite management plan uh, has to adjust based on your monitoring. So your monitoring is telling you if your plan is working or if you need to adjust your plan. So you have to count on uh, 
the results from your monitoring to help you uh, adjust, right? So you got to do that monitoring. All right, so that's my presentation. And uh, so we can open it up to uh, questions if you guys have any. Do you go and do, um, I know you'll check for supers and things, but we, you won't go back into your hives in between, right? Or will you go back in? If you say you have the 0% or less than 2%, will you go back into that hive before your monitoring plan or do you? Uh, yeah, so I like to go every couple of weeks to make, to really to kind of check on that basic um, inspection type stuff. Do I still have a laying queen, all stages of brood? Um, do they uh, have enough space or do they have too much space? You know, I do a quick inspection. Uh, you know, it might just take me three minutes to uh, go in, book around, make sure things are in order. So I don't spend a lot of time, but I definitely want to know do I have a queen? Uh, do they have enough space? Uh, does the brood look good? Do I have disease issues? And uh, yeah, I like to look at uh, my colonies every couple of weeks uh, really quick to, to assess those things. Okay. Lewis, yes. Willie has a question. Sure. Uh, alcohol is in short supply right now. <laughs> uh, do you have any alternatives? Absolutely. Uh, That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. And uh, so if you will, uh, you know, I talked about that uh, article from uh, Bailey Bee Supply earlier, and if you will visit Bailey Bee Supply and um, Randall's article, he does a, his article is about the different ways that you can monitor, and he does feature the way that I monitor in my own bees. I actually just collect my samples in the apiary into Ziploc bags and throw them in a bucket. So I just, as I'm doing my regular inspection, I just collect that 300B sample in a bag that's labeled with the colony ID number and move on to the next um, colony. And once I'm uh, done in the apiary, I throw those samples in the freezer and I'll let them, uh, I'll just freeze them overnight. And then the next day I'll process them in my kitchen uh, using basically a, a sieve and um, uh, windshield washer fluid in my kitchen sink. And I've got, uh, there's a, I have uh, two videos. One is on how I collect the samples. And the other video is how I process them in my kitchen. And you'll find those, uh, well, Randall has links, but you could just Google Lewis Cobble Varroa processing on YouTube and you'll find those two um, hmm. uh, videos. So that is, that method, has really made it easy for me to do all this monitoring. It's really hot in Rutherfordton and I like to get in and out of the apiary as quick as I can. And this method really helps me kind of just, it takes me like an extra 15 seconds to collect that sample during my regular inspection, put it in the Ziploc bag, throw it in the bucket, move to the next um, uh, colony and then just throw those samples in the freezer there's a, uh, I would encourage folks to think about different ways to, to uh, get all this heavy lifting done. We all really, we only talk about uh, powdered sugar or alcohol washes in the field, but don't feel limited to that, you know? So uh, make it, you know, find an easy way to do it, a, a way that works for you and, uh, and do it. And I invite you to, to, uh, look at my method and try it. And I bet there's uh, ways to make it even better. And I hope that you guys will, will look at that and, and, uh, and uh, try to make it even better. But the, the tools that I'm using in my kitchen, it's stuff that you already have. It's like a, a bucket and a strainer and another strainer. It's nothing fancy. You don't have to buy anything. Uh, that you probably don't already have in the kitchen or in your honey house. So I, I hope that you'll check that out. Hi, I'm Dory, and I have a question. Go ahead. Do we, can we prevent the beetles or, I mean, can we prevent the mites? No, uh, they're, like, they're going to be a part of the package. That's just part of beekeeping. So your goal is to try to um, keep up with how many that you have and try to keep that number as low as possible. 
when you buy bees, uh, you get mites with the with how, with the nuke or the package or the swarm or however you acquire bees. Uh, they're going to have um, some mites, maybe just a few mites, or maybe a lot of mites. Uh, so you need to monitor to find out. But everyone is going to have mites, and it's something you're going to have to deal with. That's a good question. The other thing I want to say with that is that these mites are not, um, they, they're not native to this bee, right? So these are kind of, it's an invasive species. This, this bee and this mite did not grow up together. They're not meant to be together. There's nothing natural about them being together. This mite was a, uh, came from another bee and they had a, a stable host parasite relationship. They got along pretty good but that might jump species from the Asian bee uh, to our European bee. And they do not, they do not have a stable host parasite relationship. And these mites transmit and amplify the viruses that are uh, the biggest challenge to bee health for us. So that's a good question. Anybody else? Are there any chat questions or anything? There's, there's not any chat questions. All right. Well, uh, if you guys have any questions about mites, bees, monitoring, miticides, anything at all, please uh, get in touch with me. Uh, you can call me. I don't answer the phone a lot because I'm driving most of the time, but please leave a voicemail and I'll return your call. And if you don't hear from me in a day or two, call me back. Uh, sometimes things fall through the cracks. And uh, so don't be afraid to give me the squeaky wheel. Just keep on with it. And so you can uh, leave me a voicemail. You can text me at this uh, cell number, no problem. And also you can send me an email uh, if you have a if you want to send a picture or anything like that. Um, but anyway, please, uh, uh, I'm happy to help uh, in any way that I can. So please um, let me know. Thank you, uh, Donna Teasley, for setting this up, and uh, Seth and, and Nagy and, and Linda Knowlton and Willie Pascal and everybody that, that pitched in uh, to make to make this thing work. I had a good time. I hope um, everybody enjoyed it too. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lewis. I thank appreciate you. you taking your evening to do it. So. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Um, thank you, beekeepers. I appreciate you um, um, taking the challenge to see if we could all get together like this. So we'll see what's going to happen another time. I guess if you decide it's worth it to, to do another one of these we can get together and decide what we want to do another time. I guess Willie and Linda can ha handle all of that and let me know. Yeah, actually, I did have a question for you. Um, so it looks like we're not going to be able to make it uh, have a meeting in May, correct? Because the extension office is closed. Am I correct on that? Yes, extension has canceled everything to the end of May. End of May. Okay. Um, Hilda, if you, uh, so we were originally going to do a hive management and possibly making a split in our May meeting, but since we're not having it, what I'd like to do is if Hilda, if you can take a minute and uh, throw out uh, a couple of ideas that you had for our, our May meeting, that would be great. Okay. Um, uh, for June, we were going to do something on honey harvesting. So I thought maybe that could be a topic that would be suitable for a Zoom meeting. Um, so we'll find someone that can explain uh, honey harvesting. Um, this may be more beneficial to the newer beekeepers, but still it may be some ideas that the older beekeepers could use also. And um, also, uh, I think it would be uh, beneficial to uh, learn how to uh, prepare honey for judging uh, if there's 
uh, some people that have uh, entered their honey and contest and are very familiar with that. Um, maybe if you would like to volunteer, please let us know. Um, but um, I know I would be interested in, in learning the steps uh, that would that would involve. And also we um, have uh, maybe more about the North Carolina um, honey, certified honey produce producers program. Um, I'm probably not saying that exactly right, but um, I know Ed Spear has been um, put in as the chairman for that. So maybe we could have some more information uh, on that. So those are just some ideas uh, came up with at the last minute, but we'll, we'll start work on that if you think it would be beneficial. Okay. Well, thank you, Hilda. Yeah. So we'll work on that and um, uh, we'll send out an email uh, I don't know, probably in the next couple of weeks, once we can figure out exactly what we're going to be doing for our, for our May Zoom meeting. So, uh, and again, I just wanted to say thank you, Lewis, for, for all that you've done. That was very helpful. Um, and I think it's, I just want to say, you know, for our first Zoom meeting, it's pretty awesome to have what, 22, 23? We had, we had 23 at our highest point. And I have to say, I've got to give credit to Seth Nagy, who's the director in Caldwell County, because he's the one who held my hand through this <laughs> first meeting. And he, the patience of Job, I have to say, Seth, you've got it. So I was, I was, I was happy. Donna helps us out a lot in Caldwell County, and I was. <clears throat> it's always fun to work with Donna. Um, and I, and I did actually get to go to the state uh, beekeepers meeting this year in New Bern, the spring meeting. Got to meet Willie in person and actually worked with uh, Dr. Tarpey. And we did a program on this very thing, which was Zoom <laughs> and doing, doing these webinars and remote meetings. So, so I was really happy uh, to, to put a little bit of this in action. And uh, so, so uh, thanks for working with me, Donna. And it's good to meet several of the beekeepers in Burke County. Thank you. Well, has anybody got anything to add? Thank you, Cooperative Extension. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Lewis. You, you Thank you. Good job, Lewis. All right, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. <laughs> good night. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.